family welcome to another episode underground railroad productions this is your host brother rich i got a new guest with me today and i got the living legend with me today why don't you two both introduce yourself Mandy. Yes, so my name is Mandy Bowman. I'm the founder and CEO of a startup called Official Black Wall Street, uh, the largest digital app and platform helping people find and support black owned businesses all around the country and in 10 other countries around the world. Excellent. I'm Professor Small. I'm just an OG who's been out here for a long time. You know. Indeed. So modest. <laughs> Indeed. So I see you got the uh, a hoodie on Happy. What's going on with, with the Happy? Oh, with the, yeah. Uh, this, this is nice, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's produced by Brother Rock. Uh-huh. But yes, Happy indeed. is this extraordinary documentary on economics um, using the Nile Valley, using the Nile River, which Africa's name is Happy, to show it as a model of how economic development takes place when it has the right ecology for it to happen. And so the, this documentary is coming out soon. Um, it should be a good tool for us to understand how to develop economics, the importance of economics in our community, and how to be able to manage that economics by knowing the roots of it, knowing the principles of it, knowing what the concept of economics is. And it isn't just money, but it's the entire environment and how you use that environment to your advantage. And so we're hoping that everybody gets to see Happy. Uh, it has some, probably the best collection of historians, anthropologists, archaeologists I've ever seen gathered for one occasion. And they're just absolutely extraordinary. Um, to see Kemet, the camera work is exquisite. Uh, to see Kemet displayed in that way, going all the way down to Sudan, to Nubia, to Karma, and then coming back up the Nile Valley, showing the importance of the Nile River as a conduit for the development of that civilization, you know, and um, for the movements of our people in and out of that civilization over thousands of years. And if we can do this then with so little at hand, think of what we could do now with the knowledge we have, the technology we have, and the wealth we have. Just African American alone reigns now as probably the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world, spending over a trillion plus dollars every year as consumer dollars um, for the last seven to eight years. That capital, if aggregated appropriately and guided by the right principles, could make our community some of the most sovereign and most powerful in the world. Indeed. You know, I was watching Claude Anderson the other day, and um, I think he was on the Rock Newman show, mm -hmm. and he was he was talking about unity. And you know, we always talk about unity. That's such a popular word that we've been throwing around forever, and we hope to, you know, unite to get this economic power that we uh, that we have or whatever. And he was talking about how the other groups, uh, the reason why every other group unites and nobody wants to see us unite is because every other group is pimping us. So I want to ask you, how do you feel about the other immig immigrant groups that come to America, whether it be the Asians, whether it, it be the, the Indians, whether it be the Arabs? Do you feel as though there's a pimp whole relationship occurring between immigrant groups and the blacks here in America, economically? No, absolutely. And I just got into a problem in Africa because I referred to and I included some of my African brothers who did not want to band with us, but would side with that immigrant group as being parasites on us, and we've become the saprophyte for the rest of the world. This is not a new phenomenon. That's what slavery was about. You know, that's what colonialism was about. Uh, that's what neo-colonialism is about. What happens to the blood? That one point plus trillion dollars that we're spending, 90% of us is going to these other groups because 
We're caught in a situation in this country, and I heard my sister Mandy speaking earlier about being able to get the loans necessary to open businesses. Redlining is still in effect in the black community, especially when you want capital to open businesses. Because if you can't control the retail and the wholesale industry where you live, you can't control the capital that you're making. And so this government has been very shrewd and its corporate structure, which is run by basic white ethnic groups, to keep the African American from developing that kind of capital unity that would allow them to provide the food, clothing, shelter, safety for them and their families, that will allow them to control the economic politics and culture where they live, and to be in charge of land, labor, and resources where they live. So there's a, there have been and still is a very heavy political move to keep us in the position of the saprophyte for the world's other communities who are acting like parasites on our community. You want to add on, man? Yeah, just one other thing. Um, even within the, the black community, you know, on every single block, you can find a, black be a beauty supply store, but it's not owned by... By a black, black person, right, mm -hmm. it's usually by Asians. And I had even spoken to a, a sister who was trying to open one in Brooklyn, and she was talking about how difficult it was because they have a monopoly on everything, on wholesale, and, and you can't get into that area because they lock it down and they only have it for their own. Mm -hmm. So even within that, in our own communities, it's so difficult for us to open up some businesses because they won't let us in. Right, yeah. like just the hair extension, which I'm not necessarily a big fan of, but it's a part of the beauty aesthetics in the world. One small community of Indians and Asians controls that whole industry so that we can't, we can buy the extensions from their retail facilities, but we don't have access to the wholesale facilities or the production facilities that they have access to. And so this kind of political control of the economics in our community by mainly non-white immigrant groups who are in partnership with the dominant white economic grouping to keep the African American population from exercising the power of their wealth possibilities. Because once you can do that, you can begin to determine everything else that happens in your community from who's gonna be the principal of the school to who's gonna be the captain of a precinct, you see. This thing allows you the capital, the wealth you get from your economic development allows you to control your political development. And that allows you then to be in charge of your cultural expression. And your cultural expression is how you teach the next generation to recreate themselves. Indeed. Well, um, what can you tell me about? Rem I remember when I was young seeing the, uh, you know, brothers and sisters in the corner store and they were black owned. And I seen a lot more businesses in the black community when I was, you know, six, seven or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they just all disappeared. Why, why do you think that occurred in our community on a mass level where all these black gas stations, I used to know about black gas stations, mm -hmm. they just disappeared like that? When I moved up to Harlem almost 50 years ago, nearly every store, every bar was owned by black folks. If you go into Harlem now, you go to Payne's to even find a bar still owned by blacks. Hardly any grocery stores. Uh, any, all the wash arrests was owned by black people. Well, because they denied us access to capital. One of the reasons we were able to do that piece back then, even with the redlining, our capital came primarily from the numbers running industry in our community. They were the oh. bankers for the black community. Once they took control of the numbers, and created the state lottery and made us criminals for trying to do numbers, they removed 75% of the capital that wow. people were able to go to a Bumpy Johnson's bankers and borrow the money to get a mortgage on a home or to send a child to school or to buy a car or to buy a medallion for a cab. That's how we were doing it. Do you know what year the lotto came into the state lottery? What, around what year was that? Was it? it had to be, what, in the 70s or 80s, maybe early 80s. Okay. You know, because when I came up here in the 60s, I remember Big Rudy oh. ran the number on 147th Street and 7th Avenue. Big Rudy took care of everybody. Mm. You know, C.W. and Mike were the main runners. Right. You know, 
anybody had a problem, they went to Big Rudy. Mm -hmm. My mama couldn't pay the rent, he went to Big Rudy. Mm -hmm. Big Rudy paid that rent. Then she had to pay Big Rudy back in small increments. Mm -hmm. um, the people saw the numbers, but didn't understand what it was. It was our underground banking system. And they took that away nationally, because it wasn't just in New York, it was in Chicago, it was in Detroit, it was in LA, it was in Frisco and Oakland. When they took away that money and our only access to capital for developing and building was to go to the neighborhood banks who decide they're not gonna loan money to us even if, our, even if we qualified, what amazes me how an immigrant who has no paper trail, no credit background, can get a loan to buy supplies and open a business, can get Con Ed to come and hook up the store, can go to the markets in the Bronx and get all of their stuff on consignment, and we can't do none of that. Because there's a, the white economic community who dominated our communities before the 60s. Our movement in the 60s drove most white businesses out. But they were determined not to let us take over those businesses. So they moved in an immigrant community, an Asian community in most cases, and to some degree, uh, some African community, but very little African community, Asian community, Indian community, Chinese community, Korean community, and to some degree, the Latin community. And they were given access to those business opportunities and possibilities. And we were left as the consumers. And it has put us in a difficult position across the country. And then they went another step further. Much of the jobs that our underclass and lower working class was doing, they were replacing the marketplace because after the 60s and affirmative action, we started asking for minimum wage, insurance, unionization. Well, how they respond to that was to bring in a population that didn't want any of those things and would even work without even having minimum wage was de-employed millions of African Americans. And then the drugs came in the community. And then the prison industrial complex expanded into privacy. And the rest we know as history right now. Did you see the, um, the show uh, with Bumpy Johnson on, uh, what was the name of that uh, show? Godfather of Harlem. Yeah, Godfather of Harlem, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm the consultant on that show. You're a consultant I, I on that show. I'm the only historical consultant on the show. Much of what you're seeing is me. Wow. You know, so, but, and Forrest Whitaker, beautiful brother, because Forrest backed me to the kilt. Uh -huh. um, but that show, we were trying to tell some of that story that I just recounted to you. You know, last time yeah. you see, I think you told me. We were just starting. We just there. started. Damn, yeah. I remember now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you were just starting. Why that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you was able to do that, my brother. I'm glad you was able to well, do that. Well, thanks to Forrest. You know, uh -huh. he, he insisted. And I got involved with a brother named Mark who mm -hmm. brought the script from Bumpy Johnson's granddaughter, Sister Margaret, uh -huh. who died when we were two years into trying to develop the thing. And so Mark went to carry it forward. Once Forrest read the script and decided he wanted to play Bumpy, it just took it to another level. Um, as you, you met Bumpy before? You you. Oh yeah, I knew. Oh, the, the key thing for me being involved, I knew Bumpy, I knew Adam Powell, I was Adam's bodyguard. I only met Malcolm once, but after Malcolm got assassinated, you know, I became the imam over his new mosque. Mm -hmm. So I was in that family, Jendra, and in that movie. Um, most of the players in the film, I knew them mm -hmm. to one degree or another. And I lived in Harlem doing that period of time. Right, right, right. So. You're talking about this this banking system we had, the numbers, mm -hmm. um, the Italians. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the Italians and how they mm -hmm. ran. How, how did they gain control over the number system exactly? Well, let's not just put it on the Italian because uh -huh. Arnold Rothstein was Jewish, mm -hmm. Meyer Lansky was Jewish, Bugsy Siegel was Jewish. It was a um, European immigrant population, mainly Jewish and Italian, uh -huh. that build what we know as La Cosa Nostra. Uh -huh. And for the same, the same things we are arguing about, they were being discriminated against by the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and the German population. So they were looking for a way to develop an economic base for themselves. Right. That economic base is always referred to as organized crime, but America itself is an organized criminal enterprise. And so the people they moved on was the weakest in the population, and that was us. So you find the Italian community and the Jewish gangsters 
community preying on the African American community because we had no sanctuary. We had no protection from courts. We had no protection from police. We had no protection from politics. So we had no sanctuary except for our own. And that's where Bumpy Johnson came in and many of the other black uh, persons we were called gangster, they was the sanctuary that protected the black community. You know, what's so interesting about the show is that I've never seen um, a show show the impact the gangsters had on our culture and on mm -hmm. religion and on spirituality. And you, I, I never thought I would see a show that shows Malcolm and Bumpy together like that. Right. So that was, that was real interesting. And, and they were real friends, yeah. for real. Uh, uh -huh. They knew each other when they were youngsters in the street, mm -hmm. when they were in their teenage years. Well, mm -hmm. Malcolm was a teenager, Bumpy was a little younger. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, history tells it according to Margaret, Sister Margaret, Bumpy's granddaughter, that it was Bumpy who helped Malcolm escape when West Indian Archie was trying to take him out. Mm. And that's when Malcolm went back to Boston, you know, and got involved in the situation that got him thrown in prison. So they would meet again. Malcolm would get out of prison, join the nation, become the national spokesperson, take over Moss Number 7 in Harlem. Bumpy would get out of jail in 62 after 11 years, and he comes back to Harlem. I realize the Italian uh, mafia is taking over Harlem, so the movie is about him taking it back. And he takes it back in a partnership with Malcolm X and Adam Clayton Powell and other elements of the black community. Who do you think is more important in our community? And, you know, we see in terms of our, uh, our rise economically, spiritually, mm -hmm. um, mentally. Um, you look at our spiritual community and you look at the, you know, uh, let's say a minister, Louis Farrakhan. Um, and, then you, and, then you, and then like you just talked about the gangsters out there. Um, how important are gangsters compared to, let's say, a, min a, a honorable minister Louis Farrakhan? Because a lot of people feel as though you know we need to get rid of the gangsters; they're ruining our community. But are the gangsters just as important as a Farrakhan in our community? Um, if you're talking about gangsters as being black men and women who had to turn to what is referred to as crime, uh -huh. um, because like my contention is America is a criminal enterprise. Um, from the top down. And so those brothers and sisters who was organized in the black community to be able to produce an income for themselves in that community and use that income to control that community, they were quite different from the individuals who happened to be criminally corrupt and preying on the community. Okay. And there's a big difference. I don't call them gangsters. These are unfortunates um, who don't have a sense of community, don't have a sense of race. Bumpy Johnson and the people in his gender had a sense of community. They had a sense of race. They wanted to control that community. They supplied money of the jobs in that community. They were able to supply the capital for people in that community to build and expand themselves. And so one of the things we wanted to do with that movie was to show uh, Bumpy being as concerned with the black community running the black community as he was with Bumpy Johnson running the black community. And one of the dialogue when in, uh, I forgot, episode maybe nine, eight or nine, where he goes to this young gangster who, and tell him, let's unite so we can control this community. And he goes all the way back and equate that slavery would never have happened if we were united. So that gets in the dialogue and he refers to that when the young man would not form a unity, he kills him. Um, because the idea is we must unite the black community, we must run the black community. And if all they leave us is the enterprise they want to criminalize, then we will control those enterprises, but we will control them for ourselves. And wow, man, that's just amazing stories hearing you talk about that. Um, Manny, what can, we, what can you tell us about this app that you uh, mentioned earlier? Please tell us about that. Yes, uh, so it's called the Official Black Wall Street app. Um, it's one of the, it's the largest app um, helping people find businesses, black owned businesses, uh, restaurants, pharmacies, um, e-commerce sites um, in the country. 
Um, so we have a little bit over 5,000 businesses now. Um, you know, you can go on there and find businesses across all different categories. Um, we even have some listed in other countries around the, um, around the world, from South Africa to the Netherlands to Japan, um, places we didn't even know that there was a large population of black people, but they're there. Um, so yeah, um, it's called the official Black Wall Street app. It's on Android and Apple devices. Um, I started a, a few years ago. Um, grew up in Brooklyn, New York, in Bed-Stuy. Um, and for me, um, seeing my neighborhood change with gentrification, it really influenced me to go out and support as many black-owned businesses as possible. Um, so it started as a spreadsheet. It wasn't necessarily a business, and it kind of just grew um, to be this massive platform. Indeed. What, what, what would you say to people who, you know, gentrification is, they don't like gentrification, but they like the fact that they could walk down the street in Brooklyn late at night and, and not worry about their safety. And they feel as though, you know, the, 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 the stores, the, 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 you know, it's, 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 beauty, it's beauty. They look at the beauty of the neighborhoods and they look at the safety and they're saying, you know, well, it's worth it as long as my kids could walk at night. Because Brooklyn had this reputation in the 80s. I mean, you it was the danger zone. Mm -hmm. So for, for somebody who appreciates gentrification and looking at it from that lens, how, what would you say to that? Um, I would say that, I mean, I guess you can call that a pro, but for me, I feel like when it comes to our local economy and gentrification, I mean, we know that a dollar only lasts in our community for about six hours. And in Jewish communities and Asian communities, it's 21 days in a month, respectively. Um, so having a, a you know a cute coffee shop on the corner is nice, but when it comes down to economics, it's still hurting us. You know, right, um, it's right. kicking a lot of our businesses out of the neighborhood. Um, BuzzFeed even had this report that showed that over a five-year period in 20, 2012, 30 percent of the black-owned businesses in New York City just disappeared. Mm. So it's doing more damage to us than good. All right, let me just pick back on that. You know, we know that the federal government of the United States, in terms of how housing was designed and distributed in this country, marginalized the African American community and make sure that the European population and Asian population had access to not only better housing, but access to the capital to get those housing. And we know for a fact, if we go back to Oliver North and General Secord, Oliver North was a colonel in the U.S. Marine, General Secord, uh, in, 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 in the, what was this, is the late 70s, early 80s, were responsible for bringing most of the cocaine in the country that was going towards the development of the crack uh, uh, epidemic in our community. And this was all coming in through the National Guard base in um, West, not, not Alabama, Arkansas, while Bill Clinton was the governor given permission for it to happen. So when we see all of this, and they were using that money from the crack cocaine that they were making, this is the government now, to finance the Contras to overthrow the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, because the federal government, the Congress had refused to give any more money towards that. And at the same time, they were buying the guns from Iranian gun dealers while Iran was still holding the American hostages. So we're dealing with a diabolical government, all right, who is afraid of the African American population becoming a sovereign, stable community in America because of our political viewpoints versus the majority of their political viewpoints. So if you can't con get the economics necessary in your community to control the land, the labor, and the resources, economics, politics, and culture, and have the protection of police to give you that safe community that that same group of policemen is given to the gentrified community, they could give that protection to our community. Okay, the same bankers that's financing those communities, those bankers could finance the black community. But instead, they make it difficult for us to get loans, they make it difficult for us to qualify for credit, they make it difficult for us to buy real estate, and they make it, even if you get the real estate and you got some capital, they make it difficult for you to get the licensing necessary to open your business and be in business. So you have to see that there is more to it than just an incident of some other group moving into your community buying property. 
It is an orchestrated piece to keep the African American population from being a competitive population. And the reason for that, if you break America down ethnically, and mostly because they played this minority game on us and psychologically got us bamboozled, but if you look at the ethnicities of America, the largest ethnic group in America is German. The second largest ethnic group in America is African Americans. But no one says it like that. They lump all the whites together. But that's not how it functions in reality. You understand? So you got the Jewish community, that's one white community. The Italian community, that's one white community. The Irish community, that's another white community. The German community. All of those others are less, they're minority to us. And so the battle is, you cannot let a population as big as the African American population take control of the economies where they live. That's why economic is the foundation for developing any community. And so by interfering with our economic development possibilities, they put us in the situation where we can be gentrified by other ethnic groups. Wow. So is... Um is separation the only, the only solution? We are already separate. They just won't let us control the territory we are separated in. You know what I'm saying? Anywhere you go in the community, the black community is over there and they're over there. Um, what we need to is to get control systematically of the economics that's going through our hand. That trillion dollars that's only staying in our community, but you say it's just a few hours. Mm -hmm. If we can keep that trillion dollars in our community for 15 days, 20 days, we would be one of the most prosperous communities in North America, ocean to ocean. What was it like in this country when integration started happening? I know my sister talk about Black Wall Street, so, and I've been out to Tulsa, Oklahoma a few times to celebrate with them um, over the years. When Greenwood was burnt down, First thing about Greenwood, we won the battle on the ground. That's why they went to the air. We had defeated them on the ground, arm to arm, man to man. And there was a Who's group. them? Like, give me some details. The Ku Klux Klan was leading the whole thing. Uh -huh. Three weeks before the attack on Greenwood, they had the National Ku Klux Klan Convention in Tulsa. Mm -hmm. And that convention was called for the purpose of gathering their troops. And that's who moved on the community because Greenwood had become more prosperous than downtown Tulsa itself. Mm. Greenwood was the black community. Mm. The, the group that led the defense of the black community is called the African Blood Brotherhood. You can actually look them up online. Mm. It was formed in New York City and it spread across the country to other black communities and made up of many young black men who had been a part of the First World War. They defeated the Klan on the ground, and that's when they went to the air and dropped the fire bombs and created the firestorm that burnt our communities down. But even after that, with all of that genocide and destruction, the people of Greenville, Oklahoma, rebuilt their communities. The community was finally destroyed by integration. Mm -hmm. this, this psychological, philosophical illusion that if we shop with white folks, our relationship with them would get better. Well, that's proven not to be true, mm -hmm. you know? But we abandon uh, our retail and wholesale business to patronize their retail and hotel business, and it has cost us across the country. You know, at 74, when I was growing up, I remember the black bank, the black grocery store, the black barber shop, um, the black everything. I mean, I never had a white teacher till I went to college. The black elementary school, the black junior high school, the black high school, everything I did was in black. I didn't have a real conversation with a white person until I became an adult. There was no need to, you know. We had our black chicken farms, our black potato farms, our black corn farm, and we were supplying one another. But with integration, that trend changed. And we began to spend our capital with the white community and withdrew that capital from the black community across the country in this effort that the media had driven and used our church leadership to drive um, with this false notion of integration. And there's actually a very good book on it I want to mention. It's called The Integration Trap, Integration Trap, Generation Gap by Obertishaka. 
And the other book that you'd want to read on it, Dr. Harold Cruz, it's called Plural But Equal. It's a scathing critique in the 80s on the civil rights movement's impact on black economics. Back in that day, did you blame uh, Dr. King for a lot of the... No, because Dr. King was not leading an integration movement. He was leading a desegregation movement. But then you had the white forces who was running media, the white forces who was running NACP who did not support Dr. King. Today they act like they were Dr. King's best friend. The NACP did not support that most of what Dr. King was doing. Mm -hmm. And so you had CORE, you had the Urban League, which was financed by white capital, and they began to set the social and political agenda using media. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so, because Dr. King in his last speech in Memphis the night before he was assassinated was very clear that we should not shop where we couldn't work. And he said, take your money out of the white banks and put it in the black credit union. He said, boycott Coca-Cola, boycott Wonder Bread, and he names others. Now, they never play that speech. They just play it apart, but they say, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, and I fear no man, now I see the promised land. Well, two sentences before that, he was saying, boycott white businesses, move your money back into black banks. This was Dr. King, but they never give us that, Dr. King. We gotta do that research for ourselves. Wow. Um, Mandy, how do you think Obama, did you think, did, did you think, do you think Obama impacted the black community economically at all? Did you see any change or anything happen with Obama economically in us? Um, that's an easy question. I would say no. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't say it's, it's not for trying, but um, I don't see that there has been any major change, especially in policies or anything like that um, within our community. I mean, he had that one initiative for um, black men, but mm -hmm. that was that was literally it. And that was after he was leaving mm -hmm. government that that initiative was put together. Um, Obama did not go. He was elected by the black vote, but he was not selected to run by the black folks. Mm -hmm. So he was running on somebody else's agenda around somebody else's interests, backed by somebody else's money. And so he carried that agenda. And we saw that agenda. It was the gay agenda. It was the gay, the Israeli agenda. It was the empowering, coming up with rules and regulations to empower white manufacturers that was taking a lot of the jobs out of the country, de-employing the middle class and working class uh, people in this country, in which a lot of us fall into, and sending it overseas to get the cheap labor to produce much of the products we see coming back in this country today. Um, I can't blame him. He was just one black man and he couldn't really go up against a whole white infrastructure that was controlled by the Democratic Party. But we, I don't want us to be under the illusion that he was some grand black president that did some extraordinary things for black people because there's nothing in his record significant that he did for black people. So, you know, I, I asked, the reason why I asked that is because I want to ask a question about Trump and, you know, who's who do we benefit more psychologically by having a, a clear overt racist in the office or having a black man in the office? It seems as though a lot of us went to sleep when Obama was in office. And it seems as though with Trump the way he is, a lot of people are waking up. Uh, not, you know, because Trump is, is for black people, but mm -hmm. because, the, you know, it's right in our face. And it seems sometimes it seems as though, you know, we need, constantly need to have a foot in our ass in order for us to see what's really going on. So in terms of Trump and us psychologically, do you think having an overt racist in government and positions of power in this country is better than having a covert racist in positions of power in this country? It sounds good, but I don't agree with that because he's too dangerous. Mm. Um, he, Trump represents the military industrial complex of this nation. That's the oil barons, the automobile barons, um, the coal barons certain commercial banking interests, um, certain other kinds of financial and insurance interests. And that, that, that element um, have functioned as a part of the most right-wing political activities of any going back in time. Even Dwight David Eisenhower, and he was an old racist, 
um, spoke against it in this last speech, telling people be aware of the military industrial complex because if they ever take over America, it's gonna really go backwards. And they have taken over America using Trump by appealing to the white underclass who had been treated very badly. I mean, um, unfortunately, and, and they were able to take advantage of it. Okay, we, we've treated our own people badly. And so we can rally them now and tell them we are now their saviors. Um, I think what the African community has to do is get serious about economic development, political development, and cultural development as a community. So it doesn't matter who is there, we demand that our interests get served. And if you don't serve our interests, you get one term, whether it's city council, state government, school board, or national office. You don't serve the black agenda, and we need to come up with that agenda and put it in the hands of everybody that's running. Is that this is the agenda coming from the black community. These are the needs that the black community needs to be addressed. And if these things are not addressed, we're not voting for you. You know, that's the power we got in our hand. We have two powers in our hand that is significant, capital and the vote. And we have not used either of them very well. You remember you raised the question of unity. Unity can only be possible when you feel a bonding and a belonging to the next person that you call black. And so until we get serious about our history, we'll never erase the white mystery. We gotta get serious about our history because history will tell you who your friends are, who your enemies are. Unity can only come if I feel I belong to you and you belong to me, you know? And that's what culture does. We have a culture in this country, but we don't act like we have a culture because we don't know what a culture is. Culture is our common experiences and our response to that common experience that we were having. It caused us to create viewpoints institutions and things that we use to defend ourselves. But since we always told black people ain't got no culture, black people don't have no, we have a culture. Any people that's having an experience together over any significant period of time develop a cultural response or acceptance of that experience. We just need to study our history and begin to solidify this culture, which is one of the most powerful in the world as cultures go, because that tells us I belong to you, you belong to me. And the, the, there was a word called Lukome. Lukome, some people think it's a religion coming out of Cuba. But the Yoruba people who not only lived in what we know Nigeria today, they lived all over West Africa, but they only knew each other from the scarification. So when they found themselves on the slave ship, they said, Lukome, you're mine. I belong to you. You belong to me. So when they got over here, that's how they identified their relationship that we belong to one another. And that's what culture does. We need to work on our culture. Our music is a tool of our culture. Our dance is a tool of our culture. Our drama, our theater are tools of our culture. Our conversation, the way we talk, is a tool of culture. We need to begin to raise it to a level of respect and stop letting other people defining those elements of our culture for us. And we need to define them for ourselves so we can create the bonding that will produce the unity. Because we've got the money. If you spend a trillion dollars, you're making money. But if you don't know how to use that trillion dollars, therein is the rub and the problem. You know. Would you like just to, to yeah, just to piggyback, I do feel like the, um, I mean, representation is amazing and, and having you know, little kids be able to see a black president in the office is great. Um, but I do think that it made us comfortable. Um, and having Trump in the office that, you know, the polar opposite, it did you know, shake us up a bit. But I think that we have to get to a point where we're being proactive and we stop mm -hmm. being reactive right. and i even see it with official black wall street where whenever there is this issue of like police brutality everyone wants to buy black and it's mm -hmm. everywhere but after that dies down you know people are quiet about it mm -hmm. so we have to get to a point where we don't need you know someone to to do something to our community for us to be proactive right. and buy black and you know have that unity that's where the belonging come into mm -hmm. see history is your conversation with your ancestry you know History erases other people's mystery that you're trying to live into. Everybody's got a history. History tells me what my relationship should be to you. History tells me what my relationship should be to Rich and to Brother Rock. History tells me how we should serve one another's interests. 
But if we don't know that history, we think we can do these things with other ethnic nations who is doing these things for themselves, but they're not cutting us in on the deal. So there's a book, another book is called Tribes. And we should all get that book. And it, it outlines the East Indian economic network from Bombay or Mumbai all the way to England, to Uganda, to Tanzania, to Kenya, to Trinidad, to Guyana, and back to Mumbai. It does the same thing with the Jewish International Economic Network, the same thing with the Asian International Economic Network. We don't have that network. We've got people in the wealth in all these places, but we don't have a network that tells the brother in Congo that I'm going to partner with the brother in Brooklyn who's got capital to help get my raw material out of this mine, and then me and him gonna partner with the brother in Jamaica and Ghana so we can use that technology and develop a manufacturing industry to, to manufacture what we're gonna get from the ores we're taking out of the ground. We don't have that kind of a network. We think that we can go and deal with the British and deal with the French and deal with the Israelis and deal with the Germans and at the end of the day come out on top because a few of us end up with a fistful of dollars which never gets distributed to the masses of our people and never go into building infrastructure, industry, and foundation for our society. You know, marriage is at an all-time low, they say, in our community. Um, how much do you think single-parent household, what effect do you think marriage has on our economy? That union in the household, is that necessary or can I just, I ain't got no, I ain't got no wife and I just get up and get it and there's a sister across the street, she ain't got no husband and she got her business, is that, will that work or in order for this economy thing to work, we have to get back to these two parent households, you think? You want to go with that Mandy first? You can get that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It sounds like your wheelhouse. Um, I believe in family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes my wife is driving me off the ceiling, but I've been with her 50 years. 50, you know? congratulations. Um, and we stayed together. We went through a lot of the crisis that tore other people apart. We didn't let tear us apart because we saw the family as being the necessary unit. We had those children, we got to raise those children. Yes, either of us might have survived and done well enough to put them to college and so forth, but there's more to it than that. There's a psycho-spiritual consciousness mm. that comes with the development of family. There's a togetherness and an onus. You saw the situation that just happened. My son heard something going on in my hometown. He called me. I called his mama. My son-in-law called the other children. My daughter called me because that's the way we move Powerful. as a family. Because I think family is the foundation of civilization. And when you study Africa, going all the way back to ancient Kemet, when you're talking about Asar, Aset, and Haru, that's the model of divinity, the black family. And all over the world, we created marriage, not as a way to take taxes from people, that's what the white folks have done, we make us buy the license, then they tax us. But the African created marriage to have the male and the female be responsible to the community for their relationship to one another and their rearing of those children in an appropriate manner. And so marriage is where the community come and witness you making a commitment to produce this building block unit called the family that was the greater part of building the greater society. This country has destroyed, as white Europe has culturally destroyed the institution, you know, by destroying people's ability uh, to make a living. Most um, young black men in our community may shy away from marriage because they can't produce the capital to take care of a family. And where we do come together in marriage and we can't produce the necessary economy, that tears us apart. And so marriage is tied right back to economics. You know, marriage and economics depend on one another. So should we, should we marry for economics or for love? That's a big old word. <laughs> Do we mean by love? Is he so fine? She's so fine? Look, 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 yo, she's so fine. And then before I know it, we're in trouble. Um, or is love attraction? Or mm -hmm. is love attachment? 
or is love dependency? Or is there an African spiritual understanding of love that doesn't even resemble what we are calling love? Mm. We are calling attachment and attraction love. Mm. We are calling getting dependent on each other sexually love. Those are things people in love do, but that's not what love is in the African context. In the African context is the universe, the universe, the totality of creation is what they call their divinity. And that we, the human being, and this is in the languages, is an expression of an aspect of that divine totality. It is the love for that in yourself that you then exit and look for that kind of love in your mate. And it is the love for the divine in you that greets the love for the divine in her that caused the unity that we created called marriage. But our concept of love right now doesn't even resemble love. You know, I, I hear some brothers say uh, polygamy is an answer to economics in our community. Where brother Ask the poor people in Senegal if it works like that. Ooh. Ask the poor people in Ghana on idea if it works like that. Uh -huh. No. Polygamy is an institution we created primarily because even today, for every one male child born, there's two female children born alive. You go back in time, the mortality rate of males were even higher. So what does the community do? You've got all of these surplus women, and you've got a society based on family you're going to have some real serious disruption and confusion unless you come up with a system that would allow for everyone to participate in the family structure. So the, the polygamy was something created by African, primarily by African women, to make sure that women could be in a productive involvement in a relationship that didn't leave them open to be exploited by men, nor for them to exploit men who already had wives. So they created the extended family where it was possible because anybody couldn't. Polygamy is not the rule in Africa, you know. Monogamy is the rule. Polygamy is the exception in Africa. People jump on that because, you know, we got other ideas about what polygamy is, you know. And so polygamy was created to create order in society and to have included everyone in the society because there is a first surplus of female in society. And it obviously worked very well before we were, you know, attacked, disrupted, and destroyed by Islam and the Arabs and the Turks and Christianity and the Western Europeans. Can I be a benefit to my people if, let's say, uh, I'm a millionaire, but I have a white wife? Do you look at me as somebody could, that could economically empower black people? And I use that, I say that because I think I'm thinking about Byron Allen. Mm -hmm. And the lawsuit he has against all these um these these TV companies, mm -hmm. and I think he's is he a billionaire yet or is he a? He said that, yeah. Right, but he has a white wife, so some I a think, lot of people are like man get out of here with that. He got a white woman, no. like you know. That wouldn't be my desired family structure, um, but I've seen many blacks who are married to someone in another race contribute heavily to the betterment of the race, okay. but. That wouldn't be my ideal thing, because there's so much other stuff that comes with that. One would never imagine a Jewish family encouraging their child to marry into a Nazi family. You wouldn't even think of it. Mm. Yet what was done to us by the general white family community was worse than anything that was done with the, to the Jews by the Nazi community. Just the psychology of that alone is damaging to our psyche. Second. Our women have been so set upon and so marginalized and so demeaned by this society through the rape and plunder through slavery and even us coming up black man and white face carrying on a lot of that abuse against them that it is imperative and absolutely necessary that we hold the black woman up as the other half of the black family in the most dominant way possible to create the most ideal black family world. Excellent, man. Excellent. You on fire today, my yes, brother. You on, you on fire. I'm, 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 you on, I'm, you, I'm, I'm my brother Richard's house. You on, you on fire today, man. Rock, you ain't tell me he was going to be like this, right? <laughs> you ain't tell me. Oh, man. Listen, well, I, I definitely, um, I know Rock didn't want to uh, stay too long um, today. Um, I definitely want to thank y'all for coming through today and, 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 and providing me with this, this amazing interview. 
Uh, Manny, I definitely look forward to hearing more about this uh, Black Wall Street. I want to tell the people more about it on my channel. I look for, I'll put the link in the description so uh, people could uh, get the app. I, I advise everybody to definitely get the app. You said you had it for a couple of years, right? Yeah, 2017, end of 2017. Well, 20, 2017. Right. Yeah. Wow, that's dope. Now, now. people in the film. Huh? Oh, you you in the film? Yeah. What what are, you, what are you dealing with in the film? In the happy film? So, yeah. So basically, talking about cooperative economics, um, how we can build the black community by banking black, supporting black owned businesses, creating more black entrepreneurs. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And and she's got a lot of role model. She got Madam C J Walker. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But then we got Sister Maggie Walker yes. out of Richmond, Virginia, mm -hmm. who during the Depression was one of the biggest black bankers in America. She actually bailed out the Virginia white banks mm. during the, the, the crash of the stock markets. Mm -hmm. And they finally put up a statue to Sister Maggie about mm -hmm. six or eight months ago in Richmond because um, she was so extraordinary. And we have so many other black women in the entrepreneurial sphere. There was another sister who built this great, even before Madam C.J. Walker, actually C.J. Walker worked for her. She built a whole college in Indiana and beauty supply products. Now we buy beauty supply from our enemies mm -hmm. when all the beauty supply was created by these black women at the turn of the 20th century. And so um, I admired you, I'd heard about you, Thank but I'm you. so happy to meet this young sister for the first time mm -hmm. because it's y'all's time now to do this world the way it has to be done. I think your generation, rich generation, rock generation, y'all are the best generation we ever produce. Wow. You've already done more than most generations before you. But because the enemy don't give you credit for what you've done, don't get confused. Mm -hmm. Know what you've done. Know the work you're accomplishing. You know? Absolutely. Thank you. Brother Rich, could I get in just one little thing? Yeah, definitely, definitely. You know, because I'm always out there doing stuff, right? About three weeks ago, me and brother uh, Alfie from uh, uh, Angola, uh, he's in the UK, he works with Diamond Radio. We did a piece where I went in heavy on CIA involvement in Africa, French intelligence involvement in Africa, British MI5, M16, that's their intelligence involved in Africa, protecting their corporate structures, which are operating as corporate raiders to steal our natural resources and destabilizing our governments and so forth. I even went in on the royal family and old cousin Megan and all of them as being a bunch of criminals, which they are. And all that wealth that they claim he making them the royal family, they stole it from us. They either earned it doing enslaving us or they stole it out of the grounds in Africa itself. Well, somebody struck back at me about four days ago, five days now, by taking a clip that I, I was doing a dialogue with Sonetta and them on 125th Street. And I'm kicking everybody in the butt. I beat up on the African American for his economic back business. I beat up on the Arabs, incursion in our community, the Chinese and so forth talking about how the Chinese controlling across the board all of the laundromats, the, the Koreans controlling the, um, yeah. the nails industry and the beauty product and the Indian controlling the hair industry. And there was an incident just before I got there where the cops had snatched some of the younger brothers, African-American brothers, tube socks, you know, the sneakers because they didn't have the license, mm -hmm. the, 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 the vending license. And the brothers from the continent did not stand up to defend them. Yet the street has been opened by us for everybody to participate. So I go heavy for two minutes critical, criticizing the brothers from the continent. Somebody cut out that two minute and sent it to Ghana. And it goes viral. And people are going crazy over there. Even to now, um, saying, and, and I'm in the middle of a hotel merger deal in Ghana right now. And it affected that. But thank God I was able to talk to the brothers. And they were able to talk to people who knew me and said, no. Some, they, they did something with this. That ain't small. We've known small for 20 something years. Mm -hmm. But I just want my people to know if you know anything about me, for 55 years I've been on the front line of our struggle. For 55 years I've been one of the most African focused Africanists out here with my life on the line, not just words. So the enemy has taken two minutes of an hour and a half discussion and used that two minutes of criticism, some of which is well deserved. I may have been a little harsh, because I can, you know, Rock can tell you, I can get like really rugged sometimes. Uh, so I just want my people to understand, uh, don't let the enemy fool you. On that same day, they crashed my computer, and on that same day, they crashed by the Alfie and English computer and wiped out our hard drives. So we know it was no little players. 
but I'm coming back at you. But, because y'all don't understand, you don't punk me out. I don't run from you. You can't buy me ever. I'm not scared of you. We going to teach you that black is back. And you got to deal with that. Well, I definitely uh, can't wait to see this film. Uh, when is it? When is it coming out? Oh, happy! What's the date? Uh, March twenty eighth. March twenty eighth. Happy is the most extraordinary piece you'll ever see on the philosophical, the ideological, and the spiritual undergirds of how you develop a black economy. And we use our historical experience in the Nile Valley, looking at the Happy River, which is the source and the essence of the development of Nile Valley civilization's culture and how we can use those concepts, ideas, and principles to build our new economy of today. And you just got to watch it. It's beautiful. Like I said, it has some of the greatest scholarship, one of whom is sitting here, Sister Mandy, with me in there teaching you about how to get your economic stuff on track. And that's what we need. We need to control the wealth where we live. Indeed. Uh, and what um, do you guys have a website? Is there is there a website for the Happy Films or HappyFilms.com? HappyFilms.com. Happy Film Go to HappyFilms.com and start pushing the buttons. And uh, leave contact information for the people so they could, you know, Mandy um, Smalls. Leave leave some contact information. Right. They can reach me at ProfessorSmallAfricanWorld.com or at my um, uh, email C small S M A L L nineteen twenty six at AOL dot com. C small nineteen twenty six at AOL dot com. Cool. And we you can find more information about official Black Wall Street on our website. It's just officialblackwallstreet dot com. Um, you can reach out to me via Mandy at officialblackwallstreet dot com. This brother Rich family, uh, I want to thank both of you for coming on the on the channel. Thank you, brother. I know the people are going to definitely going to enjoy this, and they're going to be hitting y'all up. So, <laughs> stay tuned for that. But uh, thanks for tuning in, family. We getting out of here. Peace. Bye.